I'm happy to be here. It's been a few years um, since I've been able to uh, come to the conference, and and I missed it. And I'm I'm happy to be able to be here. Um, this year, I, look, I enjoyed the papers. I look forward to hearing the conversation, and, and I enjoyed um, this uh, paper um, by Fred uh, in, in particular. Um, I uh, particularly appreciate, I guess, hearing that in the um, organic living quality of the uh, paper um, that he's come to appreciate the value um, of the interpretation construction distinction. It does have a way of um, wiggling into your heart um, uh, where you will keep it always um, uh, close to you. So, uh, so I appreciate um, that, that, um, a little, that the paper is a little less critical than it might have um, um, started out um, seeming to be. And I found myself um, um, in sympathy with a lot of the um, arguments um, in, in the paper in general. Um, I, I, and I found myself most wishing that, that the, there had been more elaboration of um, how you think this plays out in a particular constitutional context. Um, so if, you probably, if, if you've looked over the paper, you've noticed that um, uh, it's concerned with thinking about the interpretation instruction generally. It's often framed um, in fairly general terms. It um, uh, spends some uh, period of time uh, thinking about Fuller and his particular examples and thinking a fair amount about um, the contract law context and other kinds of legal context but not so much time talking, thinking specifically about the constitutional context. Um, and I wonder um, um, about uh, how some of these um, arguments that you play out in the rest of the paper carry over into the constitutional context. So part of what's um, emphasized in thinking about um, contracts, uh, for example, as well as in some other um, uh, contexts as well um, that you mentioned, is the notion that if we think of these um, terms as being embedded within a mesh um, of other um, uh, legal principles, um, rules, and considerations, um, there might be instances in which the um, uh, uh, linguistic meaning of the um, uh, text has to uh, give way um, to other kinds of considerations because otherwise the outcome is um, too extreme, too unjust um, to be um, accepted in, in, in a particular um, context. And while I recognize that as a general principle, I do wonder to what degree that you think that carries over into the constitutional context um, and, and where you think that has um, particular bite um, in the constitutional context. Are there instances um, in which you would anticipate um, um, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, for example, um, coming to the conclusion that even though we know what the linguistic meaning of the Constitution uh, seems to require in this context, uh, nonetheless, we're going to say that the result it's, it's driving us to um, is too extreme, and so it has to give way in the face of some other legal principles that, in this case, seem somehow uh, to trump the Constitution itself, which we all think of in general as being the source of most um, of the legal principles um, uh, that, that ought to be um, guiding um, the system and, and uh, constitutional interpretation application uh, more, more particularly. So I wonder to what degree you think this has um, a lot of force um, in the particular context um, of constitutions um, uh, rather, than, rather than other kinds of, of contexts. Um, I find myself quite attracted to the notion of uh, the idea that technical terms of law um, um, uh, uh, play into this in, in particular ways. I think others have recognized this um, as well. I wish a little more had been said about that in, in the context of the paper. So, um, you know, the paper notes, for example, that there are um, technical terms of law like habeas corpus that sort of don't mean anything to in context of ordinary language. And so you need um, uh, a lot of uh, relatively rich um, legal context in order to make sense of a term like that. On the other hand, the paper sort of throws off this point that you made orally as well, that there are constitutive terms terms um, that um, are important in a constitutional context, part of what constitutions do is creating or creating a set of institutions. Um, and, and that's true of law and it's true of other kinds of contexts that we might imagine um, as well. Um, but, but that's discussed very briefly in the paper, and I'm not sure what the implications are exactly as to how you're thinking about these institutions. So, for example, as we think about um, the fact that the Constitution um, is constituting a Congress or is constituting an executive branch, and so as a consequence, vest executive power um, in the president, for example, um, what significance do you think follows from the fact that these are particularly constitutive terms um, and, and what comes along with it? So one of the things you mentioned is, for example, trials in the context of impeachments, and certainly we would think that when the Constitution 
Constitution references the notion of a trial, some things come along with that, and some of those things come out of a legal context um, that the framers are familiar with, so that when they say trial, um, there's there's a set of things that they think of as being attached to that. Um, but I wonder just how much you think is, is attached to that and carries over um, into these particular contexts, especially once we start thinking about impeachment trials as opposed to, for example, criminal trials. Um, and And so, so is it the case, for example, that the Senate has a lot of flexibility about how it conducts those trials because we think, in fact, the Constitution is not very confining when it says trials. It actually is leaving a lot of space to be fleshed out by future um, uh, political decision making. Um, or do you think, in fact, the, the, that term is so rich that it, it really does conf confine the Senate uh, in pretty significant ways and, and, and um, uh, really limits uh, their future discretion? It just wasn't clear to me uh, from the discussion in the paper um, uh, how much of that um, uh, follows. Um, and likewise, there's this intriguing point, again, you made orally, that's made briefly in the paper as well, that the Constitution is full of evaluative terms. Um, and um, I think that's right. I think in general, uh, the, the, a lot of people talking about interpretation, construction, distinction, as well as originalism more generally, um, are cognizant of the fact the Constitution ter um, uh, includes evaluative terms, and they are um, uh, difficult to know what to do with in, in various ways, right? Part of the goal of originalism is to try to limit what judges uh, can do with them. My own in inclination is to think, though in part, um, the constitutional text has um, invested judges with a certain amount of judgment and discretion in order to precisely to flesh out these terms and to the extent you've, the Constitution embeds within it um, a set of, um, of, of broad principles in the context of these evaluative terms, then in fact it's authorizing courts to um, uh, take some actions on that. Um, but again, I want to know some about empirically what exactly do people think when they're when they are um, writing in some of this language and and so it's all these terms because they're valued of necessarily um, open the door to wide ranging thinking. And so um, and again, it's not clear to me from what you say how much you're thinking about this. So when I thought about the interpretation construction distinction, initially the, the person I was wrestling with in general was Ronald Dworkin. And, and part of my goal is to try to um, uh, um, uh, limit some of the discretion that Dworkin wants to import and some of his reliance upon moral philosophy to flesh out these terms. It's not clear to me whether you think that because the Constitution terms has these evaluative terms, because they're evaluative terms, then that you mean to say that the door is now open for exactly the move that Dworkin wants to make and say, well, if we're gonna make sense of um, uh, words like do or equal um, in the Constitution, then we necessarily have to go engage in moral philosophy and that's what comes along with those kind of evaluative terms. Um, or if you don't necessarily need wanna go down that path and, and um, uh, I think a lot turns on whether or not do you want to go down down that path, and and uh, I may or may not want to go down uh, that path uh, with you. Um, I think likewise it calls our attention to some questions about um, uh, uh, sort of a, a broader background principle. You're not directly concerned with here, and I don't think you need to be directly concerned with here. Um, but but certainly is in my mind as I think about this distinction in these kind of contexts is. Um, uh, how much particular institutions are empowered to try to um, construe um, this kind of language. So um, how much authority are courts in particular given um, to um, tease out um, this kind of uh, rich evaluative language um, or these uh, constitutive terms as opposed to other um, kinds of institutions. Um, and, and that may ultimately be a, a completely separate question um, than thinking about interpretation construction distinction um, as such that on top of that, we would want to layer an institutional account about, well, how aggressive do we want courts to be and how deferential should they be um, in some kinds of contexts um, and the like. Um, but again, I think it might be useful just to say something about um, uh, where, what you think the relationship is between um, this kind of language in the constitutional text and the potential implications for what courts ought to therefore um, do with that kind of language in the constitutional text. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Fred, you have couple of minutes. Okay, to... so uh, 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 delightfully, now I think we have more to disagree about than I thought <laughs> uh, 10 minutes ago. That is, um, I think Keith in appropriately saying, I want to hear more about constitutional examples, uh, says, I want to hear more about constitutional examples in which you think that the constitutional language gives way. Uh, I think um, 
I think those are interesting questions, but they're not really the questions that I'm addressing quite as directly. That is, there are instances in which we know that uh, courts have identified the linguistic content of a constitutional provision and then have said, but that linguistic content is not going to control. Uh, that's at least one interpretation of 11th Amendment cases like Hans uh, versus Louisiana and Monaco versus Mississippi. Uh, it is one interpretation um, of uh, what Justice Blackman, I think it was Justice Blackman, had in mind a couple of decades ago uh, when he said, in effect, we have never taken the con contract clause seriously, uh, and there are a few others. I'm less interested in those cases than I am in the cases in which we don't know what the linguistic content is at the outset without bringing in all of this legal stuff. And that's, that, I think, is most apparent for the evaluative terms, a little bit for the constitutive terms, but more for the evaluative ones. In terms of the evaluative ones, um, I have, uh, the uh, older I get, the less normative uh, I am. Uh, the older I get, the less interested I am in my own opinion. So I have uh, not that much to say about judicial discretion um, one way or another. I will observe, uh, since Dwar you brought Dworkin into the conversation, that there is a, here and elsewhere, there is an interesting affinity between Dworkin and Fuller. That is, uh, when Dworkin says uh, more or less in the first 20 pages or so uh, of Law's Empire, there is a difference between uh, the linguistic meaning of the words on the page and the meaning of the real statute. He's coming very close to what Fuller is saying about vehicles and all of that. That is, uh, we don't really know what uh, any of these, what any item of law means without bringing in all of this panoply of stuff that Dworkin wants to bring in. Uh, whether that's a good idea or not um, is debatable. Whether Dworkin gets the American judicial and legal tradition right uh, is debatable. I think he gets it wrong. Uh, but I think in, uh, in the remaining uh, eight seconds of my three minutes, I'll just observe that much um, that I said about Fuller probably applies to Dworkin as well. <laughs>